God asked me to tell God's story. By a lot of high theology and philosophical analyses, God doesn't have a story. God is eternal and changing. So this was a bit hard to take in. Does it make sense to you that God has a story? Oh, yeah. Jews have lived for a long time with a personal God, and they do have a sense that God has feelings, God can feel misunderstood, God can threaten, God can cajole, He can do a lot of things that we can do, and He can also be talked out of things He was about to do, as Moses and Abraham do several times. God is approached straight on. We're supposed to be creating God's image. That must mean something. If He's anything like us, He's got a story. What does that tell us about how we should live our lives? In Thomas Mann's Joseph stories, Mann has Joseph say something that's not in the actual text of Genesis. Have a care for your story. Someday, I can well imagine this might show up in a book. How would you look <laughs> in a book? Suppose this were written about. How would that look? A lot of rationalizations that people can get import from their lawyer or their psychiatrist don't look that great in a book. <laughs> you know? When people make the claim, as was once made to me by an English young man, I don't have a story, he said. And I was thinking, there's a story in that. And if we weren't in public, I would ask you about it. <laughs> what, right. what, what, what the hell happened to your story? You had written this article on the English philosopher A.J. Ayer. She felt he encountered God and saw the, you might say, enacted, yeah. uh, as you read it, the meaning of his life and the, yeah. the, the, uh, how his philosophy was unsustainable. A friend of mine said, having read your piece, what would it be like if I had to live my philosophy? And I remember thinking, well, don't you understand you are living your philosophy? How you live and how your thinking is part of how you live be something that you wouldn't mind having written up. You know, you're writing your story. You might think about it as, as sort of indelible. So if you make mistakes, you then can remedy them in various ways, apologize or make it up to somebody if you did them wrong. It's not free of mistakes. It's not free of things you wish you hadn't done. There's a dialectical character to story, dead ends and false starts and blind alleys. And sometimes you go down those to learn, oh, that's a blind alley, that's not a shortcut. So it isn't as if you're goody two-shoes all the way through and everything can be on page one, I would hope not. But you retrieve the story if you've bungled it. God is witnessing it, and it is of uh, the greatest importance. The point of having all these experiences, you know, you try things out, there's no way to know in advance, for sure, what's the right way to go. You see how they come out. I'm thinking one that you tried, it'll be in your forthcoming book, Confessions of a Young Philosopher, an episode following a kind of guru, you might say, you call it Gnostic Christianity, but that effort to kind of levitate out of existence, just jump out of yeah. the uh, course of time and living and the course of history. And you tried that for some months under this influence, mm -hmm. and I gather it didn't work out. You, you, you learned its limits. Yeah, that's not to deny that life can be subjectively close to unbearable yeah. so that you really want to jump out of it you know one way or another by embracing some delusions that you half know aren't true but put you in a more advantageous spot than you feel uh, you are in avoiding misreadings of the life plan of our stories don't have a recipe, but one has to respect the story. If you've taken a wrong turn, you have to make your way back. Filling that gap of spiritual yearning, I guess answering people's uh, existential crises and spiritual yearnings, not all spiritual forces are from God.
And I was wondering if that related to what you were saying at the beginning, Abigail. It seems as if you're being told to um, report on the inner life of God and what it's like to be God. I suppose a lot of people would say, how can you know the other if if uh, any other human being is already the other? Wouldn't God be the other of all others? You know, how can you presume to report the inner life of God? Well, of course, you're not guessing, you're being told. That seems to me one of these mystifications that this episode doesn't uh, indulge in. It's not that hard to know other people. An animal can sense what you're feeling. And you can often sense by their bared teeth and, and growls what an animal's feeling. And animals know to trust people or not. And we have a, a kind of a subliminal sense of that kind. And maybe it doesn't work as well as in animals because we are not self-attuned the way they are. I was diagnosed at one point with a very life-threatening illness. And friends of mine said to me, Abigail, no one can know what you are going through. It's very simple to know what I'm going through. All you need is a diagnosis from your doctor. And what you're telling me, instead of how no one can know the other, is you can't work up sympathy because you're too scared. Uh, and so if, if we can know the other, and I would submit to you that we can, um, and we wouldn't be able to get through the day if we couldn't, it's not out of range for us to know as much of God as God wants us to know. People always talk about how unknowable God is. All cultures in all times in history go as far back as you want to have had quite an understanding of the divine and articulated in their different ways and with different experiential components. But it all adds up to, to a surprising amount of knowledge. If you think of the other as if the other is unreachable and you can't presume to understand it, what's required is what they call empathy. You can't understand the divine just from the outside. God has a story and feelings and desires and you might say hopes to relate to those. And that's what you want to do with one another. That's what a husband wants to do to a wife and a wife to a husband and children to parents and parents to children and neighbors to one another. It touches all of our experiences if we just look at life, real life more straightforwardly. Mother Teresa used to see in the injured face of the leper Christ. And there were some German young men, guests in the house, and mother said to them, what does it feel like to be in the home of Jews? You know, <laughs> so you know, just what you never say, but it brought out their feelings about what it felt like. And that to me speaks more of personal love and God has said to you that God feels personal love for us as as we are, and and more than Mother Teresa, God bless her, and her seeing Christ. I'd rather her see Abigail than Christ. Mm -hmm.